With Summer League upon us and the draft in the rearview mirror, which put this whole channel in my rear view, uh, I wanted to talk about some of these guys and not just the guys from this class, but the guys from previous classes. And essentially, like as the draft, is, like I said, you know, we, we don't need to recap all that. It's in the past. But with the Summer League here, like even Brandon Miller, right? Because number two, if you're really into it. Like you can be really into the NBA, but you have to be into it in a whole different level to be like, all right, here we go, Salt Lake Summer Hoops. And you go, Brandon Miller, oh, he you know, made some nice buckets. Man, he fouled a lot, too. What does it mean? What's my rule with Summer League? I only let Summer League confirm my thoughts, good or bad. And if the performance disputes what I think about the player, I can just say, hey, it's Summer League, right? Um, completely inconsistent, but that's that's the game. So we know with the three guys at the top of this draft, right? Because it felt like it was the top three. Then who's in that next tier? History tells us what of the three guys that we think are special were in that first tier. And really, when Banyama's in the first tier by himself, and then it's Scoot, and then it's Brandon Miller. But of those three guys, history tells us one's not going to be any good. I mean, all three might end up being be terrific, right? But it's a bit like the quarterback stuff in the first round. You're like, oh, hey, these five guys that went in the top 14, two of them are definitely going to stink. Like they're going to be in another team going, all right, right system and all this stuff. We know all the hits. We play them over and over and over again. We keep doing it ourselves all the time. So I don't think it seems weird to go like, hey, remember when we thought Scoot Henderson was going to be good? Because <laughs> the weird thing about some of these early games is you're watching and you're thinking, wait, that doesn't look right. I mean, you remember the Trey Young experience? Like people wondered if he'd make a team in Istanbul, right? And now he's one of the most prolific scorers in the league. But those summer league games, you're like, what? is, wait, what's going on here? And it's just a weird feeling because whether or not you're super into it or you pay attention to the draft or all that different kind of stuff, you're watching. And then when you see something that's completely different than what your expectations were of that player, you're like, wait, what's happening? And again, like to the beginning of this, sometimes it's real, sometimes it isn't. There's a lot of fake stuff that happens. I think Lauren Woods won Summer League MVP. I know he won it once. Did he win it twice? Anyway, no one cares. So keep it moving. So looking at the top three guys for this class, the other thing that we're going to find out and maybe it's not that one of them ends up being terrible because it just seems weird to go like, imagine Brandon Miller just isn't good. That seems weird. That big can shoot, move like that. That there's going to be somebody taking six, seven, eight, twelve. 12 that we go, how did everybody miss on this guy? Well, welcome to the draft because it happens all the time and it will continue happening for however many years we're evaluating people and trying to predict how good they'll be at their jobs when it comes to sports. So, I want to use the 19 draft class as a mini template here to then look at some more recent draft classes and a collection of players where I'm going to separate them into four categories, all right? One category is we're good. I like it. I'm not worried about it. Now, a simple rule here with the categories, also remember this too, because instead of listening to try to dispute everything I do here, it, sometimes when you kind of listen to only dispute, which is basically Twitter, you can miss the point of some of the other things. My biggest point that I'm going to make with these categories is that I'm putting players in the same categories that I do not think are the same basketball players. All right. So same category does not equal same player, same player profile, same expectations. It's just hey, here's a list of guys, recent drafts. I'm good with who they are right now, and I'm not worried about it. The next group that's probably the most interesting is the TBD group, where we've seen some things. Some things are really good. For some guys, it might be a little too early, but there may be some lingering concerns if your expectations, this player should be a little bit more than they are right now. Then there's the third group called the come on dude group, where they're top 10 picks, where maybe there's those little flashes every now and then, and you're kind of like, wait, yeah, but if you don't do anything this year, like, who are we kidding? And then this group could be really, like, it could be longer, but I don't want to do this for multiple drafts where it's just over. It's just, nah, not going to happen. Like, I don't expect anything anymore. Um, you are simply an addition in a trade to help salaries match up. There's some of the come on dudes that are just on a one-way track right now to the no group. So now that we understand the rules, we hope. I'm going to run through some of these guys. Now, let's start with 19 because they're not into this, this exercise. They're kind of like the template for what I want to talk about. Zion, yeah, and by the way, the 19 class was like really screwed up the whole process of this, but hang with me here. Zion, we know as a basketball player, is really special, all right? We know he's also never healthy, and it doesn't seem that he is, let's just say, locked in. I don't think we're ever going to see an Instagram video where he's on a podcast. He's like, I start my day at 2.45 a.m. By the way, I think those guys are such frauds. 
I'm sorry. Like you're eventually going to have to make up the sleep somewhere else. Like you're at the gym at 3 a.m. Fucking sweet. You really would be that much of a loser if you, you win at nine. All right. Anyway, rant over. Uh, we've got Zion at the top of that class. And I know it's kind of like, well, wait, what group would you put him in here? If it were just basketball, I'm good with him, the basketball player. And if he were to stay healthy for like a four out of five year stretch, play some games, win some playoff games. I don't know that, you know, it doesn't feel like a great bet right now, but if it was just the basketball part and he were being able to play consistently, I think we'd see somebody who then would maybe be knocking on the door of like, is this guy going to be in every all-star game every season? And then we're going to start arguing that he's a top 10 player. And then is he going to get to that top group, which I think is like maybe five or six guys where he guarantees you a chance of competing for a title where it really may not even be five or six guys. Maybe it's two or maybe it's three. Look, I don't know if Zion can even get to that, but the fact that I'm still open to it because of how impressive I think is just he is just as a basketball player, I think it's still a fair thing to say about him. The problem is, is that once you get into that group, then when you don't win, then we get to dump all, all over you in a new way. And Ja actually is a perfect segue into that because the basketball part about Ja is what? He probably can be a number one, maybe not a number one of like LeBron or Steph or that kind of stuff or Giannis or Jokic. And he's getting close to, let's start seeing some of this stuff in the playoffs, but he's going to make probably every all-star team. He's somebody that may flirt with the fourth or fifth votes in an MVP season. You know, that kind of stuff. And just like Zion, if he were to have a really good statistical stretch, all-star games, five years, get through all the bullshit, because I don't know that his bas- his non-basketball stuff is going to derail the basketball stuff the way it feels like Zion's potentially could. And I'm not talking about sex. I'm talking about his health. Uh, Jaws stuff just seems stupid, and he could probably turn this around if he wants to rather quickly, and he'll be back on the court and be putting up huge numbers. It'll be really good. And then if they lose in the second round all the time, we can shit on him again, too, like we love doing to all these top guys in the NBA. All right. Garland is in that group. Hey, we're good. He's made his money. He's not the same concern as those other two players. He may not be as good as those guys, but I really like him. All right. So that's that's kind of what we're working with here at the top end. So if I go through recent draft classes, which I've done in the past too, like going back to 2013, that was the Anthony Bennett class. I've been on this top 10 picks and how long they stay with teams. The average for the 2013 class was four and a half years for the top 10 picks, how long they lasted. Um, 2014 was 4.85 years. 2015 was 3.8 years. The Ben Simmons class in 16, that class is the worst of the four that I'm looking at here. 3.35 years on average for those players. And if I keep going further to more recent drafts, then it becomes a little unfair because the guys in those classes haven't had as many years to kind of bump up that average. But that's pretty crazy that four straight drafts, you're looking at these guys that are supposed to turn around your franchise, more so at the top and pick seven to 10. But the averages, they don't even last like four years or after four years, they're not even on the team anymore. And a lot of times, too, they're in trades because they're considered still somewhat valuable, even if the reality is they're not going to be real players. All right. So let's go through the categories. Good TBD. Come on, dude. All set, which is like, nah, it's not going to happen. All right. The first guy is Anthony Edwards. I think he's the best player out of this list of guys that I'm going to go through here. I'm not concerned at all. I think he has a chance to be like really, really special. Uh, It's not going to happen anytime soon. You don't come into the league and like three or four years in, now you're helping your team win a championship. It just doesn't really happen. Maybe in olden days or a guy like LeBron. But even LeBron, it took a little while. Um, So with him, I'm not remotely worried about any of it. Um, Franz Wagner. Now you're saying, wait, you think Franz is as good as he is? You think Franz is better than all those other draft picks? No, I don't think he's as good as Anthony Edwards. But from what I've seen, I'm not worried about it. He's going to get a nice contract after the rookie deal is up. Um, he does a lot of things. I think he plays well with others. Uh, I would love to have Franz on my team. I think he fits into a bunch of different things. I'm going to stay with another member of the Orlando Magic, Paolo. I really think he's going to be that good. I know it's only a year in. It feels too soon. It'd be way too soon if he were bad for a year to go, hey, I'm off of him. But the positive of it, I feel really good about it. I don't know if he's going to be Anthony Edwards or any of that stuff, but the first year at least leads me to believe like the trajectory of what my expectations could be for him as a player. They seem to be right on schedule. And then Josh Giddy. Again, don't think Giddy's these guys, but from what I've seen from Giddy, how I think he fits in a bunch of different ways, the way he sees the game at such a young age. There's some other things that I wish were better, but I'm not going to put him in the TBD thing because I think we already see the foundation of what he's going to be as a player. 
Let's get to the TBDs because I think this is where it starts becoming mistake prone. LaMelo Ball. Now, something came up when LaMelo got his max extension and Halliburton got his. A bit of a rule break here because Halliburton wasn't technically a top 10 pick. But if you watch Halliburton, watch LaMelo. And I understand that some of you would do the same or things that are similar are the same. And it's one of my favorite things now. Like thing, everything, like if you want to put together resumes and make it look like they're the same guy, you could do it. Hey, LaMelo's hurt. Oh, so is Halliburton. LaMelo hasn't done anything with his teams. Hey, the same thing with Halliburton. If you honestly watch a lot of basketball and you feel like LaMelo is the same person as Halliburton, then we just can't be friends. And that's fine. I don't want to be friends with you in the first place. That's why I think LaMelo, despite the great stuff that we see from him, and the injuries aren't entirely his fault. It's not like his injuries and missed games are the same concern that we've had with Zion. But he's missed a bunch. And I do think there's this high-end excitement that blinds some from the in-between plays where you're like, is he always locked into the winning part of this? Is his overall 35-plus minutes a night, is that always about winning basketball? And I'm not sure of the answer yet. And it may seem unfair to put him in this group, but the reason I have him there is because I think the way he's talked about, that the expectations of what he could be are beyond the actual player, even though the numbers are really nice and the money's there for him, which makes sense because he's Charlotte star. And that's why they did it. RJ Barrett, also TBD. He's getting real close to come on, dude. I don't even know if he's ever going to figure it out with the Knicks. I don't think Tibbs is a huge fan. We've been over that all season. I don't know if there's another national podcast that covered R.J. Barrett's minutes patterns more than this one did. Honestly, I'm embarrassed I did it that much, but that's the point. He's a nice player, but when you go as high as he did, there's still some hope that maybe there's some other level. We're probably kidding ourselves that there's that next level. Cade Cunningham, TBD only because he missed his second season. The injury is a concern. I loved what I saw from the first season. I think he's going to be terrific, but I can't put him down in the I'm good category until I get another year of him healthy. Evan Mobley, I like him. I like him a lot defensively. I also didn't like the playoffs, just like the rest of you. Offensively, something needs to happen with him where he feels like he's more of a threat that was exposed in that playoff series. We'd all take Evan Mobley, but for those of us on the higher end of it, no more so than Bill Simmons, even more than me. There's going to have to be a step taken this season offensively where you feel like there's a there's something in his game that's really tough to deal with defensively, and I don't know that he has it yet other than the putbacks and transition stuff. The passing is great, but you know, again, this is about big expectations for Mobley more so than a guy like Giddy, who I was okay with. Jalen Green is below Cade and Mobley in this category. I have no idea what's going to happen with Jalen Green this season. I can't wait to see it. The numbers are going to take a hit. So yeah, if you're just going all the counting stats, you're like, wait, look at Jalen Green did this. Jalen Green did that. He did all these different things. Yeah, the counting stats are sweet. I also think there's like 20 other young perimeter players that they were just given the ball and the parents left like Jalen Green had. Like a bunch of those guys would have the exact same numbers. It was about opportunity. Yes, he's super talented. I remember the game at Boston where my buddies that were like, wait, you're on the fence about this dude? He's killing the Celtics tonight. I'm like, yeah, it was a really good game. And that's why you still hold out hope because Twitch-wise, athletically, like there's some really special stuff with him. I don't know if his life's going to get easier because the defenses are going to be less focused on him because Van Vliet's there, or he's going to be watching Van Vliet and Brooks shoot the whole time going, what do I do if I'm, if I'm not shooting every other possession besides Kevin Porter Jr.? So yeah, TBD on him. And this one hurts a little. Scotty Barnes of Toronto. Loved the rookie year, loved him before the draft. We knew the shooting was a concern. It looked like, wait, maybe there's a little bit more there his first year. Everything just felt like it was kind of a, it just wasn't what you wanted to see from him. You saw like, I don't know if regression is the right word, but it wasn't another step up. We'd all take Scotty Barnes, much like a lot of the guys in this group. But I want to see that look more like rookie Scotty Barnes than sophomore Scotty Barnes uh, moving forward into his third year. By the way, you know LaMelo's middle name is LaFrance? Interesting. Okay, come on, dude. Kaminga. Pretty self-explanatory. Yes, there are flashes. You know what? 450 plus guys that play in the NBA, they're all pretty good at basketball. There's usually going to be some flashes. Now, granted, Kaminga's flashes are probably more impressive than 90% of the league, but um, the non flash stuff, it's just not there enough. Jalen Suggs, still holding out hope. Smart, competitive, fights his ass off. Not sure how he fits into this guard rotation with Orlando. 
defensively, maybe that's what he becomes, a defensive role player that hopefully develops a shot by like year five. But based on what we thought he could be, when we thought the weird thing was that Suggs fell to the magic behind Scotty Barnes. And now it's like, is he going to be a defensive bench guy? Patrick Williams, a little bit more offense, probably feel better about him than I do Suggs at this point. You could put Denny Avdia here, maybe a little Obi Toppin. Um, but I don't know, maybe I'm pushing a little bit. The Nad dudes, the guys I'm over, I mean, Cam Reddish have been over probably before the draft. Um, and I'm just going to be excited to see Lakers fans act like he's wing Mo Bamba. Uh, James Wiseman, self-explanatory. Killian Hayes, we could go all day with that. But that's the difference. I think you were watching Kaminga. There's part of you that's still like, maybe, maybe. And then that no thanks group, you're like, wait. Like, who plays like this this many years to start their career and then becomes somebody that's not even an all-star, just like a real rotation guy uh, who figures it out later on? At least with Wiseman, I still feel like he plays hard. He just doesn't know what he's doing. And again, that list could have been a lot longer, but I don't want to keep going all this. Here's what I'd say to finish up. It's too soon on Jabari Smith, Ivy, Shaden Sharp. Matherin, who I think I kind of know who he is right now. I like the way he plays. I like how aggressive he is. You could also argue he comes in with the second unit, and he basically just attacked all the time, so let's not freak out about it. Fair. I like him. But I think the biggest mistakes we make are the TBD group. Another year of the same or another year of regression? This is usually where we're telling ourselves the lies. This is where we usually start talking to ourselves in a way where you're holding out hope for a player you know you shouldn't. And that's the group I think we end up making the most mistakes on. 